Our next lecturer is, I'd like to reintroduce Dr. Barbara Henley. She will be speaking to us this morning about updates and overactive bladder treatment. I'm not going to review all of her prior credentials since we did that yesterday, but she does come to us from um, MCG Augusta University. Thank you. Thank you again for having me. Um, this talk is quite um, quite different from my talk yesterday. Yesterday, you know, we talked quite a bit about one of the biggest tragedies in our field in urogynecology, and today I'm excited to talk about um, some of the progress. This in this area of overactive bladder, we've made quite a bit of progress in the past um, in the in the past decade, but certainly in the past two years, there's been a tremendous progress. So I'm excited to share some of this with you. Again, I'm a, I'm a consultant for um, Allergan Urology. So today we will review the pathophysiology of overactive bladder and understand some of the risks and benefits of anticholinergic medications versus beta agonists for treatment. And then we'll review um, third tier treatment options, including percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation, and intravesical Botox, and sacroneural stimulation. So again, why is this important? What we do is largely quality of life in urogynecology. So we'll review some stats for urinary incontinence in particular. It's one of the 10 most common chronic conditions affecting women in the United States. Up to 55% of women in the U.S. will have some type of urinary incontinence, and the direct costs are tremendous. 12.4 billion annually, which is greater than the cost of breast cancer treatment, which is about 9 billion. So this is a significant problem. Not life-threatening, but significant, significant effects on quality of life. And we found that um, patients that have OAB are, um, have a high likelihood of having other comorbidities, including urinary tract infections, falls and fractures, depression, significant vulvovaginitis and skin infections. And patients with OAB, men and women, are 20% um, more likely to see a physician than those without OAB. So again, there's a significant um, clinical burden on these patients. And something I find interesting, and I think we see this theme um, recurrently, unfortunately, but despite the um, prevalence of OAB and the high cost, only a fraction of women actually seek treatment, 25 to 50%. So it's really important that as providers, we ask our patients about these symptoms. And I think um, in the past, particularly, you know, primary care providers have been hesitant to even address this, or I've heard from so many patients that their primary care provider, and even some of their GYNs, unfortunately, have told them that it's just a, a part of aging, and that was that. So um, please ask your patients about it, and um, I, in our community, actually, we've seen um, a significant increase in just referrals because I think in our community, um, providers are confident that if they do bring this up, they can just send them on um, to someone who's very, very happy to treat this pathology. So please, um, if you don't do it yourself, please find those individuals in your community who are interested in treating. So it, what is overactive bladder? It is a syndrome, and it's defined by the International Urogynecologic Association and the International Continent Society as urinary urgency, usually accompanied by frequency and nocturia, with or without urgency urinary incontinence in the absence of a UTI or any other pathology. So I'm a visual learner, so I think of it as, as this triad. So it's some combination of urinary incontinence, urinary urgency, or and um, urinary frequency. Patients may have all three of these symptoms, they may have one of these symptoms, but the, the, key, the key takeaway is that it is a clinical diagnosis. You don't need any fancy testing to diagnose this. You just need to rule out reversible etiologies that may mimic or cause these symptoms. So most commonly, a UTI. 
You also want to make sure patients are emptying appropriately. And in the absence of any reversible etiology with these symptoms, OAB and you can initiate the treatment pathway. So no fancy treatment required or diagnosis required, at least for um, initial diagnosis. So to understand some of our interventions, um, it's important to review a little bit of the anatomy, particularly for our medical students. Um, the bladder has uh, three layers, the internal layer or the urothelial layer, the um, middle layer, which is the detrusor muscle, and the detrusor muscle itself actually has three layers. The internal and external layer are longitudinal muscle, and the internal layer are the circular muscles. And then there's the external layer. Well, in the detrusor muscle itself is responsible for the contraction of, of the bladder, and the external layer, this fibroelastic connective tissue, is responsible for bladder expansion. And the bladder is pretty simple. It has two main functions. One function is to store urine, and the other is to void. And the, the filling phase of the, of the entire micturition cycle, that storage phase, is um, the longer of the two phases. Um, and during this phase, the bladder, the detrusor muscle relaxes, and the urethral sphincter um, contracts and closes. On the opposite end, the emptying phase or the voiding phase of the micturition cycle is the shorter phase. The bladder contracts and the urethral sphincter relaxes. And when there's a defect in any one of those processes, that is when we have urinary incontinence. So overactive bladder syndrome is a neurologic defect, unlike stress incontinence and other types of urinary incontinence. So to review, um, let's review a little bit of, of um, neural anatomy affecting the bladder. The bladder um, is innervated by both the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. The sympathetic nervous system is responsible for storage. So that's the fight or flight, I think, of, um, for the students. Fight or flight, you don't want to, you want to reserve all your energy, so you're just storing urine. Um, this is uh, mediated through the um, T11, um, L2 uh, nerve roots. It's responsible for detrusive muscle relaxing and, relaxing and um, the internal urethral sphincter contraction. And it's mediated by noradrenaline, which activates the beta-3 and um, alpha-1 receptors. And I have an image of that next. Um, the parasympathetic nerves are responsible for the rest and digest, so you can release. So, and this is mediated by sacral nerve roots two through four, and it's responsible for the emptying phase. So the detrusor muscle contracts and the internal urethral sphincter relaxes. And this phase is mediated by acetylcholine, so M3 receptor activation. And this image just um, demonstrates where these receptors lie. I don't know if my, oh. So the um, M3 receptors and beta-3 receptors are within the detrusor muscle. The M3 receptor activation contracts the, contracts the detrusor muscle and the beta-3 activation um, results in relaxation. And similarly with the alpha-1 receptors, that um, keeps our urethra nice and tight with activation. So again, diagnosing this clinical syndrome, you need to rule out reversible etiologies that can cause these symptoms. And so treatment of those reversible etiologies will typically result in resolution of these symptoms, not treatment of OAB. So you wanna make sure there's no um, infection, particularly a UTI. You wanna rule out bladder stones if you see any blood on their point of care urinalysis. You want to rule out bladder tumors if you see blood. Um, interstitial cystitis if there's a pain component to this. Um, and you want to rule out an outlet obstruction. So one of the re um, most common causes for OAB symptoms in men is an enlarged prostate. So you need to address that, not give them an anticholinergic medication. Um, metabolic factors. Patients with poorly controlled diabetes may have polydipsia and polyuria. Treatment of, of their diabetes may result in an improvement in those frequency urgency symptoms. Certain medications, diuretics, antidepressants, antihypertensives may also contribute to these symptoms. And then you also just want to do a, a really good review of system because we know that um, 
other symptoms and issues can cause, can cause OAB symptoms like constipation. So with OAB, we have first, second, and third line therapies. And we like to start um, most conservatively, but typically or very frequently patients may have treatment with all three um, levels of therapy concurrently. So first line therapies are behavioral therapies. And again, these may be combined with oral agents and even third line. As we, as we go up this ladder, we continue to remind patients that this is a syndrome and it's a chronic syndrome. There is no cure. So it's important to consider the behavioral therapies and things that can aggravate the bladder as we um, move up the ladder of treatment if necessary. Um, the second line therapies are oral agents and the transdermal um, pre preparations. And um, second line um, um, treatments may also involve just dose escalation or changing a medication. And then third line therapies are all listed and we'll go into all of these in, in a little bit more detail. One thing that the evidence shows over and over and over again is one, as I mentioned earlier, patients often will not um, tell their providers that they have these symptoms and they'll suffer in silence. Or two, they'll have the guts to tell their provider, their provider gives them a medication, it doesn't work, they have side effects and they don't return or they don't address it again. That is very common. And even among providers who I think I have a high return rate and when you look at even, even when I look specifically at my patients, I know that I have, I have about a 15% um, uh, loss to follow up for OAB patients. So one thing that we've done, and overall in Eurogyne offices, it's about a 30% loss of follow up with OAB symptoms. So something that um, that our office and many offices have implemented are these are these care sheets. And so if a patient comes to us with OAB symptoms and they're naive to therapy or they're on first or second line therapy, we give this sheet every patient with OAB leaves with a sheet and we tell them, let's give um, this therapy an opportunity to work, but if it does not work, please don't be discouraged. Come back, we have other options. And that has really um, increased our, our treatment rates. So first line behavioral therapies, bladder training, um, we discussed timed voiding or delayed voiding, um, pelvic floor muscle strengthening, urge strategies, biofeedback, electrical stimulation, and, and a lot of these are mediated by a pelvic floor physical therapist or an advanced um, uh, um, nursing staff in your office. Uh, fluid management, um, dietary changes, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. We know that weight loss has a significant, profound um, effect on the symptoms, and certainly smoking. Smoking cessation is something that we really spend a lot of time talking about and offer resources to help with that. For diet, I, I, um, I reference CATS for the patient so they can remember. Um, caffeine and um, citrus can be significant bladder irritants, and then cranberry juice and cranberry supplements. So a lot of times women are like, well, that's good for my bladder, right? Cranberry is great. And cranberry is really good for men and women that have recurrent UTIs. But we also know, so it may not be the best thing for men and women with overactive bladder because it can be a bladder irritant. Um, alcohol, unfortunately, is an irritant, tobacco, and um, spicy foods. And so I tell patients, you don't need to stop all of this, but you need to understand the effects that this can have on your bladder and your symptoms. So maybe instead of drinking five cups of coffee, like me, you may just want to limit it to one or two. So just, you know, because when I, when I tell patients this, they seem surprised. Really? You know, all these things have an effect on my bladder, so just a little bit of education can help quite a bit. And then you want to find your local pelvic floor physical therapist. Um, thankfully, this um, training is becoming more and more prevalent, and um, more and more communities are fortunate enough to have a pelvic floor physical therapy. We have Teresa Morneau, who you all were here from. I'm so glad that um, I don't have to follow her because this woman is brilliant and she does tremendous things for our patients. But one thing I've noticed in our Augusta community, when I first got there 10 years ago, there was one. 
and there was one for about five years and now we have several options one thing i noticed i think there's like i don't know maybe eight or something like that now in augusta but there is a difference not everybody's the same and i mean that, that goes with i think any type of provider but some providers are better at you know the more mainstream pelvic floor muscle strengthening behavioral therapies but then some patients have more complex uh, symptoms so you really want to identify in your community you know which therapist you need for for what because someone like Teresa she's really really booked out really a high skill set so the medications are our, our second tier therapy and uh, the anticholinergic medications have been on the market for decades and I'm sure you all are familiar with most if not all of these oxybutynin is the the um, the mainstay generic but um, tolteridine, trospium, they're all on the market still. But um, these medications have significant uh, side effects, dry mouth, dry eyes, constipation. And those are the ones that patients notice almost immediately if they occur. The one that has gotten a lot of attention lately and it has really changed our management quite a bit is the cognitive dysfunction. That is not something that patients tend to identify quickly, but we realize that um, there's a significant association, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But because of these um, side effects, when, and also there's a transdermal um, um, formulation, the oxytrol, oxytrol or the oxybutynin patch, that's the only one of these medications for OAB that is over the counter. So you can get it from Target, Walmart, Walgreens, what have you, for about $30 a month. Um, the, the patch um, eliminates the dry mouth, dry eyes, constipation, but it is still associated with the cognitive dysfunction. So the new class, new meaning 10 years, the new class um, are the beta-3 um, adrenergic medications. So Mirabegron was the original, and it's been on the market for about 10 years now. So it should be um, generic um, by now, but it's not. So one of the limitations for um, these medications is cost. Um, and Vibegron um, is, the, is the new kid on the block as of April of this year. And it is extremely cost prohibitive. So, you know, we have this fight in my office. There, my PAs, they prescribe it all the time. I don't, I don't even bother because, you know, it just delays the treatment process. Um, but um, they're good options. They um, eliminate these side effects. We don't have to worry about the cognitive dysfunction, but the cost is a big barrier. One side effect that has been reported, um, it is not um, terribly common, but you do need to be um, careful in patients with hypertension. In, um, in the studies, um, Mirabetric has been shown to have a, an association with an increase in hypertension, but it's only about um, two points. Um, by Begron, they tote that, um, that, that this is not in their labeling. They are very similar in structure. So I think it's just, I personally think study design um, is really the difference and not because of a, a formulation, but that's my opinion. Um, both of these medications are safe. The biggest limitation is cost. And what we do know, and this has been shown over and over again, that compliance with medications is limited. Um, this data here is, um, related to anticholinergic, so it does not include beta agonists. So theoretically, maybe compliance with beta agonists may be higher, but right now I would probably think no because of the cost. Um, but um, the data shows that for at least anticholinergics, within six months, 70% of patients discontinue the medication and 80% discontinue within a year. And the majority of these patients don't restart it. And then um, we've known for some time that anticholinergics are associated with cognitive dysfunction, um, but to the degree um, has still not been well understood. When I was in fellowship, we would find very frequently that we would start patients on an anticholinergic, and when they came back, we learned that their geriatrician discontinued the medication. So it was this um, tug between um, um, the, the two providers, but Augs um, published um, the August, the um, American Urogynecologic Society published this consensus statement um, last September or September 2020, um, really discouraging 
the use, using strong language, discouraging the use of anticholinergics in um, women over 70, and to caution um, the use of these medications in younger women. So in our practice, we've just discontinued. We've encouraged patients to stop if they're over 70, and, um, and then any patient that we start the medication on, we um, tell them of this potential long-term effect. So then this is the dilemma that we often find ourselves in. The 66-year-old female with a 12-year history of worsening urgency urinary incontinence. She's tried pelvic floor physical therapy, and she was on an anti-muscarinic medication without symptomatic improvement, and she couldn't afford a beta agonist. So then what do we do? So at this point in our, in our practice, we would do further testing um, to rule out some other etiology before we moved on, um, before we move on to third tier therapies. So we would typically do a cystoscopy to rule out stones, to rule, rule out a bladder lesion, lesion, and in patients that have had prior surgery, we wanna rule out mesh erosion or suture erosion. Um, and then for the urodynamics, Many times, you know, a great history gives you your diagnosis most of the time, but sometimes, particularly patients with mixed incontinence, it's difficult for them to communicate or even fully understand that stress incontinence may be a significant um, burden for their symptoms. Um, and so urodynamics can really kind of help us tease out um, the presence of stress incontinence and how significant it may be for that patient. But really, we're also looking at their emptying mechanism and seeing if, you know, maybe they have a weakened detrusor contraction or no detrusor contraction at all, and they're just, avoid, they're just voiding abdominally, and, um, and they're not fully emptying. Or they have... Um, um, pelvic floor muscle dyssinergia, which is best treated by physical therapy. Um, so the, the studies give us significant information. So the third tier options, um, and these are defined as third tier options by both the American Euro, um, Urologic Association and AUGS, are um, intravesical Botox, percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation, and sacroneural modulation. So I'm excited because a lot of these have just um, become, become on the market or prevalent um, in my time um, treating women with these um, disorders. So intravesical Botox. Botox in general has um, nine clinical indications, and four of them are in the urologic world. The FDA approved um, Botox for OAB in January of 2013. I believe it was 2008, 2009, it was first approved for any urologic um, indication, and that was for um, neurogenic detrusor overactivity, which is a very different population. Um, dosing is different, um, diagnosing is different, but for idiopathic overactive bladder, it approved in 2013. Um, and it's clinically indicated and well supported by insurance, but clinically indicated after failure of just one oral medication. So historically, the thought was that we had to try them on two oral medications, and you can imagine how much that delayed treatment and increased the loss of follow-up. So we can do this, um, at this intervention after failing one medication, and failure can be um, lack of efficacy or compliance or you just couldn't afford the medication. For whatever reason, the patient was unable to continue the medication. And this um, can be done in the office. So some providers do, um, do this procedure in the operating room, but increasingly it's being performed in the office. We do it routinely in the office. Um, and it's important um, for access because it does need to be repeated. On average, women need the therapy twice a year. So on average, six to nine months. Um, insurance supports up to four times a year. So for something like this, you know, I've learned that um, compliance with this treatment is so dependent on counseling. And I kind of, you know, patients are like, oh my gosh, I gotta come in twice a year. But I, I kind of liken it to going to the dentist. We get our teeth cleaned, or we should, twice a year. So, um, so you know, they're like, okay, I can do that. So, um, Intravesical Botox is a really effective treatment, up to 100% um, reduction in daily leakage. So what does that really mean? 
the majority of patients, about 60%, will have at least a 50% reduction in their daily incontinence um, episodes. So that's pretty good, um, but um, about 40, 45% will have a, at least a 75% reduction in their, um, in their daily episodes, and then about 30% will be completely dry. So it's a really good treatment option with, with really good improvements, and you avoid some of the um, GI um, um, side effects. And one thing that you know people question is does it um, does the efficacy decline over time? And we have great um, studies to demonstrate that that the effects um, persist. So this is a three-year extension trial of patients that received um, the treatment twice a year, and it showed that that their efficacy remained stable over that three-year period. So it's a really a good long-term treatment option for patients for the the um, the appropriate patient. But um, like with any intervention, there are potential side effects. And the two that are most prevalent are urinary tract infections. And so the initial studies and even follow-up studies have supported about an 18% um, rate of UTIs with um, intravesical Botox. So it may not be a great option for patients with recurrent UTIs. But one thing that we do, and we found a significant reduction in our UTI rate is um, is starting prophylactic antibiotics um, prior to the procedure. We, we do a six-day uh, prophylaxis, three days before, three days after the procedure. And that has really helped our patients. And the other thing that was a really, really big deterrent initially is um, the retention rate. And the counseling and the language that you use is really important. When I first started doing this, um, I was really strict. I talked about urinary retention. You have to be able to self-catheterize if you're gonna move forward with this therapy. And patients were, were resistant. But when you really look at the literature, urinary retention was not defined as the incomplete ability to void. It was defined as an elevated post-void residual. Most patients with an elevated post-void residual do not require self-catheterization. So the way this information is used best is that for patients that have um, elevated post void residuals after their intervention, you may not want to repeat it, and you may want to do something else. But um, when I talk to patients, I am open and I'm very honest, but I also tell them that we will support you through this. If you are in the category that requires self-catheterization, we will help you through that, and um, we will move on to other therapies. This happens very infrequently in our office. Basic, basically, patients who had a post void residual of 350 or above those patients are the ones that you really do want to encourage um, self-catheterization until those PVRs are under 350 because you want to protect the, the kidneys and minimize the risk of ureteral reflux. So moving on to neuromodulation. So when I was preparing this talk, you know, I, I, I wanted to figure out like where to go with this. And one thing um, that, um, that the review really helped me understand is that neuromodulation is used in so many disciplines, so many disciplines for, for pain and just treatment of so many clinical issues in medicine. So there is the International Neuromodulation Society that defines neuromodulation as the alteration of nerve activity through targeted delivery of a stimulus, such as an electrical stimulation, or chemical agents to specific neurologic sites in the body. And the reason why I highlight this is because often when I, when I bring um, these treatment options up to patients, they're a bit confused that I'm talking about nerves and bladder. Um, and I never thought that I would be talking about nerves and bladder as an OBGYN resident. Um, but um, given the etiology of OAB, we need to target um, the nervous system. So a little bit of, a little bit more anatomy, bear with me. So tibial nerve stimulation is another third tier therapy. So the tibial nerve is um, one of the, it's the larger of the two terminal branches of the sciatic nerve. And the sciatic nerve um, bifurcates or splits at the distal thigh. The tibial nerve innervates the posterior thigh and the common fibular nerve, the anterior, or, I'm sorry, the the posterior leg, and the common fibular nerve innervates the lateral and anterior leg. So we'll focus on the tibial nerve. 
So the tibial nerve descends um, down the popliteal fossa and it dives deep to the soleus muscle. And then it ends distal um, and posterior to the medial malleolus. So sometimes you may hear the nerve referred to as the posterior tibial nerve. And technically that's a misnomer because there's only one tibial nerve, but it, it dives, um, uh, it travels posterior to the, to the medial malleolus. So um, the stimulation um, travels retrograde um, to the sacral nerve plexus. And this therapy was first identified in the early 80s by um, Ed McGuire and his group at University of Michigan. And, that, and he identified that these um, retrograde impulses actually suppress um, neurogenic detrusor overactivity. The exact mechanism of action is unclear. There's thought to be some um, central nervous regulation, some peripheral targets directly to the bladder, but likely a combination of both. And this is where things get exciting for me. There's also, um, there's the a transcutaneous approaches to this therapy, percutaneous approaches, and soon to come at some point, implantable stimulation. This therapy is probably, out of all the third tier options, is utilized the least in our office. And you'll see, and I'll, I'll touch a little bit as to why, because this requires a significant commitment from patients as it stands right now. But I think that's changing very soon. So percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation was FDA approved in 2000. Um, it's, the indication is for non-neurogenic idiopathic OAB and it's administered using a 34 gauge needle, so very similar to an acupuncture needle. This needle is paced, um, placed four to five centimeter cephalad to the medial malleolus, and um, flexion of the big toe confirms the correct positioning of the, of, the, um, of, the, of the needle. And in our office, this is performed by our nursing staff. Um, so this is the commitment. The patients have to come in weekly for 12 weeks for 30 minute sessions. So even if your patient is retired, many of them may require a family member to help them. So it's just, it's a big commitment. It's a big, I, I could not commit to that. Um, and then even after the initial run in of 12 weeks, um, there needs to be a maintenance. And the maintenance schedule is just based on the individual patient, typically monthly in the beginning and maybe um, six months, Q six months um, down the road. And then there's also variable insurance coverage. There's about a five, six year period um, between like 2008 and maybe 2012 or something like that where that um, Medicare, Medicaid didn't pay at all. And um, that has changed. So um, it is supported, um, but again, there's still variable um, private insurance and coverage. And the support and the, the success rates are quite variable. And I'll demonstrate that a little bit. So the, the success rate that we often report is the, about a 71% success rate, meaning 71% um, of patients have a 50% reduction in their symptoms. Um, and this was based on a very small, not well-designed study, 35 patients with DO. Um, these were 30-minute sessions three times a week. And this was not an intention to treat analysis. So patients that were lost to follow-up for whatever reason weren't included in the calculation. And we all know that's not the best study design. Um, so the summit trial is a bit more um, of, of a, a much more robust study. And this was a, this was a multi-center trial, double-blind RCT, um, with 220 adults, male and female. So the population included men, which is not our population. Um, and still they used a 30 minute treatment session, 12 weeks um, duration, but this was an intention to treat. So all patients were included, even those that um, were dropped, dropped out of the study or lost the follow up. And this study reports a, a lower success rate of about 55%. So then there is the transcutaneous tibial nerve stimulation. So like the TENS, this is the TENS unit for OAB. And for this, pads are used rather than a needle. A live pad is placed in the similar location, posterior and superior to the medial malleolus. And then there's a grounding pad placed um, about 10 centimeters proximal to the live pad. 
And one of the limitations to this are various treatment protocols. We don't know the ideal treatment protocol, um, but one of the benefits is that patients can do this at home. Um, they can buy a unit on Amazon if they want to and do this at home. Um, and this was a study that compared transcutaneous versus percutaneous. This was a non-inferiority RCT. Um, the, all of these patients had their therapy done in the office in this study. Um, uh, one, one day a week for 12 weeks, 30 minute sessions. And then the maximum amplitude was determined um, by patient tolerance. And 77 patients were enrolled, um, 68 were randomized, and 34 were analyzed in each arm. And this just shows that both um, the PER protocol and the intention to treat um, analysis showed no difference um, in efficacy um, between um, the, the two technologies. So both of them showed an overall quality, an improved quality of life and there was no difference in the quality of life between the two. There were no serious adverse events and um, no difference in adherence to treatment. Um, as I mentioned, both um, for this study, they were both performed in the office, but my suspicion is that, um, that the transcutaneous, since it can be done at home, that that may increase compliance. So the future of transcutaneous um, tibial nerve stimulation, larger studies are required. We need to determine the, the optimal um, treatment frequency, duration, and the stimulation parameters. And then do a true cost analysis for our patients. But I'm most excited about the implantable tibial nerve stimulation. So there are none currently on the market. I was promised in February that March I would have I would have the opportunity to implant. Um, but there are there are several companies, and so um, there are a few that have had, that have published some robust studies already. So I, I thought to highlight these and some of the differences. But you can see that this implant is about the size of a, of a quarter. Um, it's a wireless implant, so a 35-minute um, procedure. It's a cut-down procedure that theoretically could be performed in the office with local anesthesia um, or, or just, um, yeah, local anesthesia, um, possibly in the operating room. One of the issues with this is just the reimbursement and, and how to get this um, reimbursed for the provider. Um, this particular implant is rechargeable, so um, and you see this, the, the, the ankle bracelet, um, <laughs> the, um, it's ex external power source, some kind of concern that patients may be worried what that may imply. But, um, it's, so there's an, there's an external power source. The therapy is 30 minutes, um, three to six days a week. Again, this can be done at home, and the Optimus trial is one of the trials done for, for this um, particular device. This was a six-month multi-center perspective intervention trial for uh, 34 patients with idiopathic OAB, and they, they're, they reported a 71% success rate um, at six months, so similar to the PTNS. And then the future is the OASIS trial. It's already an FDA-approved trial with the goal to um, enroll 250 patients at 25 European sites to evaluate the um, safety and efficacy of this. Bless you. Ecoin is a similar device, um, but this is um, leadless. It's titanium. It's about the size of a nickel, and it requires a three centimeter incision adjacent to the distant, um, the distal tibial nerve. Um, now this one has an intrinsic battery, a three-year life, and it's automatic, automatic stimulation. So the patient doesn't have to do anything. So 30 minutes, um, um, twice, um, two days a week for 12 weeks, and the maintenance is 30 minutes um, every 15 days. And the pivotal study is a, a prospective open-label single-arm trial with 137 subjects with refractory urgency urinary incontinence. Most of them were female. And they reported a 68% um, success rate at 48 weeks. And there were 16% device-related um, events at 52 weeks. So promising technology. And then, so finally, um, third-tier options, sacroneuromodulation. So um, of the neuromodulation um, devices, these are the oldest. Um, and this um, involves chronic modulation of the S3 nerve. 
first FDA approved in 1997 in the, in the U.S. Um, it's been on the market um, since 1993 in Europe, so it's not new at all. Um, in 97, it was FDA approved for urgency urinary incontinence and then for urgency frequency. So I didn't make this distinction, but OAB as a syndrome, there's OAB dry, which is this urgency frequency and OAB wet. OAB dry tends to be a little bit more difficult to treat. Um, and so um, this uh, received an indication for um, OAB dry in 99 and for non-obstructive urinary retention, which is wonderful because prior to this intervention, the only thing we could offer women with idiopathic retention was either self-catheterization or an indwelling catheter. And this has really good success rates for this. So um, I'm, I'm so grateful for, for um, this technology. And then in 2011, um, the technology achieved its um, indication um, for fecal incontinence, um, refractory fecal incontinence. In Europe, all of these indications were approved in 1993. So for this therapy, there are two components. There, there is the battery, um, and then there's the quadrupolar lead that actually goes into the S3 foramen. So there have been several studies um, that support this therapy. Um, Steven Siegel and Karen Noblet are just the pioneers. Steven Siegel is a urologist and Karen Noblet is a urogynecologist. Um, they have done a plethora of research really supporting the success of this therapy. And this is one of the, the significant trials of 340 individuals. Um, and for this study, I'll, I'll go into more detail on this in a moment, but there currently, the way this is implanted, there is a test phase and then there's the full implant um, if the patients that undergone the testing had significant improvement. So in this study, there were 340 patients that went the advanced testing and 272 or 80% actually went, um, moved on to full implantation. And um, the success again um, was defined as a 50% um, reduction in their symptoms. And it was reported between 67 and 80, 82%, depending on how, um, the completers or p individuals who, um, if, or if you include individuals who dropped out or had explant, it was a lower success rate. And then complete continence, the, lumber, the numbers were lower, but to achieve complete continence is pretty impressive. So 38 and 45%. So 2019, my life changed. So from 1997 until 2019, any woman who who thought she would need MRI. So in my, in my case, it would be um, women with, with MS, and we have a big MS population. Um, any woman that, that needed an MRI regularly were not candidates for this because it was M M MRI incompatible. So, um, and something that so many providers were really pushing for a long time. And this is where competition just breeds innovation, and I'm just excited. Um, so in 2019, the summer of 2019, um, the FDA approved the Exonix uh, sacral neuromodulation symptom, um, system, very similar. Placement is similar, everything's similar, even they kind of look alike. So finally, for the first time in over two decades, we have um, two um, devices. And, and then the improvements just continued from there. So their device, when they came on the market, their device was a um, rechargeable, implantable battery. Smaller, but a 15 year battery life. And it was MRI compatible. Um, studies uh, led by some of the big key players in this space supported this success. And these studies were performed a little bit different, stronger studies, um, um, a little bit more robust, but reporting even a higher success rate, 93%. Patient satisfaction was high, 94, 93%, and they um, were pretty satisfied with the charging experience. There were adverse events reported similar to the um, older studies, pain at the implant site, um, new pain, potential lead migration, infection at the site, um, technical problems with the device, um, adverse change in bowel voiding function, and undesirable stimulation. 
So just to compare the two, so I did a similar talk in March, and since March, I've had to make two updates to this slide. Um, so Interstem or Medtronic now has two IPGs, an implant, a, a, um, a rechargeable one, as well as a non-rechargeable one, which is their original, but their, their rechargeable lasts about 15 years. The non-rechargeable is reported to last over 10 years. Um, and when I say last, after when this battery expires, the patients need to undergo a, a, a surgical procedure to have that battery replaced. Every implant on the market is MRI compatible. Um, and for the inner stem um, chargeable device, one of the things that is less desirable about it is that you have to charge actually four components. So that can be a little challenging for patients. For the Exonix device, um, they have two batteries now, a non-rechargeable that's 15 years, a rechargeable that's 15 years, MRI compatibility, but their rechargeable is only um, two devices. So you may ask, why would anybody use a rechargeable device? I think that the rechargeable device is probably going to go away because um, this, there's just been so much um, innovation that um, now both companies have a non-rechargeable long-term battery. So I don't see, no patients in my office are, are electing for the rechargeable anymore. So overall, so those are the differences and similarities between the technology, but this pretty much, how this procedure is done is the same between the two. Um, every patient, and this is required by insurance companies, and, I, and I'm a fan of it, but every patient um, before moving on to the full implant must undergo a basic evaluation or an advanced evaluation. The basic evaluation is a temporary lead that is placed in an office setting. It takes about um, 30 minutes to do in the office. Um, and the evaluation period is up to seven days. Um, just local anesthesia, tolerate it well. It's a flexible, thin wire. Um, I believe it's about um, a 22 gauge um, wire, and um, you can use fluoroscopy for this. We don't. We just use bony landmarks. Most most people, most gynecologists use bony landmarks, and urologists often have um, fluoroscopes in their office for various reasons. So they often use fluoroscopy um, for the advanced evaluation. In our office, we do the advanced evaluation for certain patient populations. So. Patients with fecal incontinence, patients with um, um, primarily idiopathic retention, obese patients, patients who say they can't tolerate needles. But for the majority of our patients, we do the office evaluation. For patients that require or desire the advanced evaluation, they have two visits to the operating room within 14 days. We typically do this in our surgical center. Um, and the big difference is that the advanced evaluation utilizes the quadrupolar lead. So it's a, it's a wider lead that has plastic tines and it's the permanent lead that will ultimately, ultimately remain in place. But the basic evaluation is a temporary monopolar lead. It slides in very easily. It slides out very easily. Um, so the advanced evaluation needs to be done in the office for patient comfort. I mean, it needs to be done in the OR for patient comfort. And um, we use fluoroscopy for this. And then if the patient has a greater greater than 50% improvement in their symptoms, then in that second visit, they have the, the IPG implanted or the battery. So these are just um, the bony landmarks that we use. In the office, we um, palpate the, the coccyx and measure 11 centimeters proximal to that. And on most patients, that's where the S3 nerve is. We know that during the test, we, may, um, we actually may be in S2 or S4. Um, we, patients still can demonstrate a low level of improvement and qualify for um, moving forward with therapy. Um, and, but in the OR, we use fluoroscopy. So these are just beautiful images. And we place this lead in the upper medial aspect of S3. And in the office, I mean, in the OR, you can assess for um, motor stimulation or if your patient is awake enough, you can actually um, um, assess sensory. I used to try to do both um, when I first started independently, but um, with variable anesthesia, some people were very uncomfortable with, with light, with the patient being light and comfortable. So now I just rely completely on, um, on motor um, assessment. And these are images of the leader um, 
AP images and lateral images of proper placement of the lead in the operating room. And so what we're looking for, so the sensory response, if we, to know that we're in S3, and it's really important for the final lead to be in S3 and not S2, because S2, the patients will complain of um, pain in the leg and the, and the great toe. So for um, S3, the patients will describe a tapping sensation or pulse or butterfly or flutter um, in the perineal area. Rectum, vagina, somewhere in the perineal body, we know we're in the right place. For the motor response, we just look for bellows or contraction of the levator muscles um, and flexion of the great toe. So almost done. What's next? So back to our patient, our 66-year-old female with refractory OAB. Couldn't afford medicines. Medicines were ineffective. So it really depends which therapy, which um, uh, third-tier therapy to, do we do. Does she have recurrent UTIs? May not want to do Botox. Does she have incomplete emptying? You definitely don't want to do Botox because that's going to make it worse. But we know that sacral neuromodulation also helps with incomplete emptying. Is she a surgical candidate? If not, then you may want to stay to Botox or PTNS. Does she have fecal incontinence? Well, great. Sacral neuromodulation is great. It is so great for patients with dual incontinence. Um, how willing and capable is the patient um, in making frequent office visits? If not, then she may need to go with sacral neuromodulation. Um, and then what is her cognitive function? Is she able to deal with um, the, the device? And that's one thing. Patients, I, I discourage my patients from, they, with when they have this implant, they do have a device with either company. They can increase the intensity, decrease, make some changes unless they're really, really savvy. I just tell them to leave it alone and we can help them. Um, and that's that, and my favorite slide. <laughs> Any questions? Well, thank you, thank you. Oh, there's, okay. So y'all know my patients want to have their baby in the bathtub, so their mothers want to only take their medicines when they go on vacation, like their anti I figure, I'm like, your problem can't be that bad if you only want to take this two weeks a year. Is that? It doesn't work. Okay. So that's one, that's one thing I tell patients, that um, when patients come in and they say they've tried a medicine before, and I ask them, well, how long were you on the medicine? Oh, a week then they didn't have a real trial. So you really need to be on oral medications for at least four weeks before you determine failure because it takes that long for them to work. I have a question for you, and thank you. That was really interesting and updated. Um, my first question is not one time did you miss, mention the use of vaginal estrogen. And I feel that that's kind of our go-to treatment initially. So is it evidence-based, not proven to be? I failed. Um, I failed. <laughs> because I failed. I I no, no, really. Okay. I mean, that is absolutely, absolutely. It's almost like, you know, just such an, an every patient with OAB needs to be on vaginal estrogen. So it's like brushing your teeth. I just, I don't talk about it. Okay, okay. that's, do it. oh, thank you. <laughs> and then my other question is, how, what is the coverage like for these um, implantable devices for both commercial as well as Medicare patients? So coverage is excellent, but it is a very expensive implant. Um, but coverage is excellent, 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 especially for Medicare and, and Medicaid. I can't do uh, Medicaid patients in the surgical center, um, but it is the coverage for patients is excellent. They get the bill and they see how much it actually costs, but um, but their um, proportion is, is minimal. But the um, one of the reasons why insurance requires a staged is because the lead itself is about twelve hundred dollars, but the IPG is about sixty thousand. So we don't put the IPG in until we confirm that it works. Yes. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm Heidi, I'm from Georgia. Yes. Uh, Savannah, nice to see you. I just have a question coming from fellowship into attending Hood. We learn about all these great things from literature. So for the transcutaneous, how do you bill for that? How do you get reimbursement for that if you're not actually doing the procedure in the office? Right, that is one of the most difficult things. And that's one of the things, you know, I, I tried to highlight that one of the limitations of it is the variable insurance co um, coverage. And so that's why, that's one of the reasons why um, it's the least use of the third tier options in my office. 
um, we really we, we submit um, to the insurance companies for prior authorization and before we move forward and it is quite variable and it's really hard to predict which company which insurance companies will support it and which won't um, and that's one of the I think that's one of the um, the reasons why the implantable implant is being delayed because it's a really great concept and I think it's going to be a really good tool in our toolbox but it needs to be done in the office because it's not um, we're not going to be I, I think it would be a, a poor financial decision to be done in an operating room because it is such a, a small procedure. But then the office right now with the current model, we would lose money doing it. So nobody's going to, you know, offer that therapy. No matter how much we want to help people, we still, you know, got to keep the lights on. So um, until that's ironed out, that therapy is just not going to be well utilized. All right. Thank you, everyone.